Being a father. Amen. Being a father. Yesterday I was with my two daughters. Oh, it's yesterday? Yes, Friday. Friday. Friday's different. We took us, took us out to eat, and would you believe they paid for it? <laughs> they did. So I like Father's Day. Two children. It took us seven and a half years to get our first daughter here. And uh, we wandered, and sometimes we wandered. And little did we know that when she finally came that she was going to have trouble. But there was a situation that we didn't know anything about. And that situation was that there was going to be a blood disorder. So we took her to the doctor, and, and they really, they kept her. We couldn't bring her home. So anyways, they uh, said, uh, we, my wife and I went home and for a couple of days, and they said, well, we're going to change blood. They messed up on changing the blood the second time. They thought, Lord, what's going on? What's going on? We got her home, and she just uh, happy and healthy as she could be. About 15 or 20 years later, Pastor Church in Ohio, we had a man that came from Romania, joined our church. He was an engineer. Later on, his wife came, and she was a medical doctor. And so anyway, they, we joined church, and then we got rumors that they had a daughter. I said, where is she? She said, oh, she's home. I said, well, why isn't she here? Well, preacher, preacher, she called me, preacher. Peacher. So Peacher said, she's, she's got some problems. I said, can she come and sit and get away again? Yeah. But I said, bring her. And so she brought her, and she was all deformed and barely could walk. But, uh, 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 and I'm not, I'm not making fun. I'm just coming to a point. God works in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. So anyway, we began to talk. And... Uh, me and that daughter kind of, she loved to shake hands with me and everything. What's wrong? What's wrong? Said she had a blood disorder when she was born. Same age as my daughter. I said, what did they do? He said, they couldn't do nothing. They didn't know what to do. We look back on that and realize that the seven, seven and a half years that we waited, we didn't know that we was waiting on God so they could get a remedy in the United States of America. For that situation. And I've learned that as a father, that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And we as dads and, and the fathers and husbands, the responsibilities and the duties that we have to stay in tune with the Lord, in touch with the Lord, because we don't know what the Lord's leading us sometimes, directing us, and just keep your mind open. And that's sermon number one, and we'll look at sermon number two now. I want you to turn to the book of Job. Old book of Job and uh, the oldest, one of the oldest folks in the Bible. And I want to preach you a message today on, on of course, fathers. Fathers. And we, there's a, some good examples in the Bible about uh, fatherhood and the leadership of a, of a dad and the leadership in the home. In the book of Job, chapter 22, I'm going to read uh, three or four verses. And I just want to share these things with you. Uh, he said uh, in verse 1 there, he's talking about Eliphaz, the uh, Timonite, answered and said, and notice these words in verse 2, if you would, please. Can a man be profitable unto God? As he that is wise may be profitable unto himself. It is any pleasure to the Almighty. Is it any pleasure to the Almighty? that thou art righteous? Or is it gain to him that thou makest thy ways perfect? That thou makest thy ways perfect. Father, we pray now that you'll bless this day. Bless this moment now. And we'll be careful to praise you. In Jesus' name, help me, Father. Holy Spirit, lead God and direct. And we'll praise you in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. When we think of Father's Day, of course, we think of the leadership in the family. We think of Dad going to work all the time. 
and just so many things in Father's Day. But when we look in the Bible, we find that uh, God has some special characters. You know, there's some special places and things that God has organized, and he's organized homes. He's organized government. He's organized countries. And uh, he's used men to do that. I look in my scripture, I look in the Bible today, and we see, first of all, I want to just two or three men I want to bring to your attention. A man by the name of Abraham. We all know him. Uh, Father Abraham. The little chorus we used to sing. But what about Abraham? Abraham was a very special man. And he, he seemingly was a home man. He was concerned about his home. And we see in Genesis chapter 18 and verse 19 concerning Abraham. What a great guy he was. But we see in the ver verses there, for God said, for I know him. I know Abraham. What is that about him? Keep in mind, God knows you too. God knows us. I know him. But not only that, he says, and he commandeth his children. What a character. What a need that we have today. He's going to set up an organization, as it were, of the whole. And he chose Abraham. Why? Because of this very, that he, he knew him because he took control of his household, took control of his children. The rest of that phrase, the rest of that verse says simply this, and his household after him. It's amazing how the Holy Spirit put children first. But children are, ought to be almost first. And oh, how in the days in which we live that we need some direction like that. Amen. We do need some fathers today that will direct their children. And we have a lot of children that have no earthly idea who their father is. And consequently, they're just, can I say it, just grown wild in our country. So he commanded his children in his household well. And notice that they who, his family, his children, shall keep the way of the Lord. Genesis chapter 18 and verse 19. What was the cause and the reason for that? That they may keep the way of the Lord. Amen. What in their whole lifetime, through the leadership of a dad, through a father, to someone that as they were growing up, he established them, he corrected them, he taught them the ways to go. Why? Because he had a plan and a purpose for them to teach them the way to go. There's another man by the name of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a very strong man. He was an excited man. As Abraham had an element to forge a home, Jeremiah seemed like he had an element to forge government. Government, taking charge of people and things of that nature. And we see this in Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 1, that Jeremiah was a, a godly man, and uh, God told him, he said, I want you to run to and fro, of the streets of Jerusalem, and see and know, listen to this, if you can find a man, if you can find a man, God's looking for men. Men will do this, that, and another. But he's telling Jeremiah, if you can just find a man, what is that? If there be any, listen, who will execute judgment. He's talking about government here. Who can establish a government for our people? that they can come and establish a government and um, uh, simply this, and not only that, to the streets of Jerusalem and see and know if he can find a man that will establish judgment that seek the truth, that seeks the truth. Not what he wanted, what he desired, or anybody else, but seek the truth, the truth of God, Jeremiah. Ezekiel is a very important man too. As we have the home, the government, but then the country as a whole in Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 30, we see just simply this. He said, and I sought for a man among them, seeking among men, seeking among the, the populace, that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me and for the land. For the land. He was doing it for the land. We see that, they, that uh, Jeremiah was executing judgment as far as the government controlling the people. Abraham concerning the whole. These things are very important for us. And I want to bring that to your attention. But as we look at all these things and think about it, what about the man? What about a man? Any man? Just think of the responsibility and the duty that we have as 
fathers and husbands and men of our country, the duty that we God wants us to have. What is the requirement of a man that God can use? First of all, I want us to see this morning that God can know of the man's and his relationship with God, his relationship with God. It's an important thing that a man might be powerful in his community. He might be a rich man. He might be a manager. He might just be a lay person. He might have all kinds of authority and power, or maybe no power whatsoever. But God is just looking for a man who will love him and care for him. Have some caring, if you would, please, in that. In Job chapter 22, we, and uh, let me see here, in, in Job chapter 22 and verse 21, listen to that, verse 22, verse 21. According now thyself with him, acquaint now thyself with him, acquaint now thyself with him, and be at peace thereby, good shall come unto thee. What is this? It's a man that loves the Lord. It's a man that's in, in, in connection with the Lord. It's a man that God has put first, uh, the man has put God first place in his life and in his home and in every aspect that he does. Just simply this, and thereby shall some good come unto thee. A man that's seeking the Lord and wants to serve the Lord in all aspects and everything. We see in the book of, of Philippians chapter 3, uh, that uh, it's an important thing here. If I can find it here. Do you have it on the screen there, buddy? Okay, it said, but what things were gained to me, those I counted lost, what? For Christ. Think of that. When I searched for the Lord and I found him, I seeking the Lord in my life, seeking God, we as Christian people need to have the Lord in our life. Everyday experience, everyday doings, and just what things were gained unto me. No doubt it's a very important thing that we see uh, in those things. Good men, good men. And then we see in, in verse 8 there, what did he say? Yet doubtless I count all things but lost for the excellence, so this is this now, of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have offered the loss of all things and do count them all but dung that I may win Christ. You see, Paul had gone through all kinds of suffering. He lost everything, humanly speaking. And all of this was just to gain what for the, for the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he said, it's just nothing but trash. It's nothing but worthless and so forth. And so we see in the next verse there, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, but is of the, of the law, listen, but that which through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So what is he saying there? That I realize that when I put God first, everything was nothing in this life. I just put everything behind me and forgot it. And Paul did. He was a lot, had a lot of power, a lot of authority in his lifetime. But yet he laid aside all of that and started serving the Lord, worshiping the Lord, doing what the Lord wanted to him. And most of the New Testament is written by the Apostle Paul. A man that put God first, above money, above everything in his life, putting God first. God is looking for men that will put him first. Because if we put God first in our life, it's amazing what God will take care of the rest of it. Amen. He'll take care of a little girl that was born, that the doctors said if she had been born five years early, we would not know what to have done. But her dear daddy was saying, why don't we have children? Why can't we have any children? Not knowing that God was totally in control. Isn't it amazing and isn't it great to know that God's in control? Amen. Not what we do, what we think, what we desire, but God's in control. Looking for a man, looking for a man. What an important thing that, that is. We see also in, in that we're looking for a man that, that the house of God is important. The house of God is important. Terry, I don't know if I'll follow everything you're doing there. Look in Psalms chapter 23 and verse 6. Psalms 23 and verse 6. What are you saying there in, in these verses? He says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And what's the rest of that? And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. For what? Amen. Forever. Forever. Think of that. What is he looking for? He's looking for a man, a God, a God man, 
But he's looking also for a man that this building right here, just the building itself, is very important. But the importance is not because of the building. It's important because of the people that's in the building. And he said, I'm looking for a man that's important and, and, and that will put the church first in his life. First, it's church first in his life. And that's, that's a very important thing there. He said, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of a man is. Look in chapter 22, 122 and verse 1. He said, I was glad when they said unto me, what did he say? Let us go. Where? Into the house of the Lord. Didn't you get up this morning and say, I can't wait till I get to church. Amen? Amen. Well, I better take a shower before I go, but uh, it's an exciting time there. But don't you look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. Hebrews 10 and verse 25. We'll get it there in just a moment. Not forsaken. Uh-oh. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves to where? Together. What is he saying in that verse? We're looking for a man. We're looking for a, 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 a leader of our home or our house. What, what does he need? First, he's got to put God first and then put the church first. God put the church here purposely. Why? To preach the gospel to every creature. To carry the gospel around the world. And then what does it take? It takes people. And for he just say they're not forsaking them. You know, when we stay away from church, we're doing harm to three or four things. Number one, we're disappointing the Lord. Number two, we ourselves personally. But not only that, the testimony to your family, let alone to our neighbors. Oh, don't forsake the sending of yourselves together. Why? As a manner of some is, but he said, exhorting one another, and as we come through that door, and as we go out that door in a few minutes, you're going to shake hands, how are you? Are you looking good today? How are you doing? And, and just encourage one. You know, it's an, it's an encouragement thing that when we come to the house of God, we have, we have the mentality of Christ, the Bible, the blood, the cross, the second coming, salvation, and all of those things. We have them in, in common with each other, and then we begin to talk to each other, uh, and, and don't coming to church is so important. He's looking for a man that has that desire to when it's Sunday, what do we do? No questions asked. Sunday night, no question asked. Just looking for a man that will put God first and put his house first. And not only that, through his tithes and his offerings and all of those sort of things. And he said, forsaking not the assembly. The assembly. Forsaking not. What does that mean? We will not forget. We will not forget. The assembling of ourselves together. What an important thing that day that is. So we're looking for a man that knows God. We're looking for a man that will fellowship and take charge and be in church, Sunday school. Be there when it's prayer meeting time. Be there when there's Sunday school time. Be there when there's Wednesday night services. Be there when there's choir practice. Be there that when there's funerals. Be there when people are sick and ill. Oh, the importance of a man, men and women of God, to fellowship with through the elements of the church. Of the church. And it's kind of sad to say, it's the day in which we live. We're seeing a great falling away. A great falling away. Our churches, I would say our independent, fundamental, Bible-believing churches are thinning out somewhat. And it's a sad time. But he said simply this, that's, a, that's going to be one of the signs of the time. Don't let you be part of the sign. Don't let you be part of the pastor being discouraged. Just And, and it's not because of the person that you fellowship with, per se, even though it's part of it. It's not to be encouragement to the pastors who prepares and preaches and serves us during the week and then he comes and preaches and teaches us on Sunday morning. It's not just because of that. It's because that God instructs you to and instruct us to. As God's people, when we think of what he's done for us, oh, and what can we do? Where did we find Christ? I found him in 810 Benton Street in Big Spring, Texas, and a boy about 10 years old. 
I found my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I was saddened several years after that that they tore that old building down and moved and built another new building. But that new building, as great as it is and so forth, doesn't mean anything because 810 Benton Street in Big Spring, Texas is where I got saved. Thank God for the church, for the church. So we see that uh, we need folks that let the church not be parts of your life, but let church be a part of your life. Mm -hmm. Thank God for your being here today. And then on Wednesday night, Sunday night, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. We're looking for a man that will place the church of God first part in his life. Thirdly, the man that will take his position of responsibility and duty in the home. In the home. Keeping the way of the Lord. Genesis chapter 18, verse 19. Terry, you would. Genesis 18, verse 19. We look at and see these things and, and uh, about the, the home situation. And I don't know, I've got him, I'm out of sync with him. But we'll just slip over and read it from the Bible. He said of Abraham, listen to this. For I know him. This is uh, Genesis chapter 18, verse 19. For I know him. Why? That he will command his children. Uh -oh. Know him first. Then he will command his children. Command his children. Lois and Reba's got one of their sons here today. Did he command you very much? Uh, he was grinning like a possum right now. And uh, how many have children here today? How many have children? Let me see. Do you, did you command? Did you instruct? <laughs> yes, we did. How many of you hated giving a spanking? Yeah. Oh, boy. Hated those. How many that... Um, yeah. Was you talking about Eddie? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I, thought, I thought you were. But um, to think of, of, of in charge of a home that God has given us with a wife and then those children come along. The re, one of the problems, excuse me, one of the problems we're having today is daddies haven't taken their responsibility. Amen. 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 Lord help me. Lord help me. My father in law owned a place in Texas. It's an old washer tier. He bought it, cleaned it up, made it a nice place for the neighborhood. Had a lot of people coming in and his business was great. I mean, he had a, every kind of people. And he had regular customers. He'd come on Monday, and, you know, some come Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, every Wednesday, here came Joe, here on Thursday, here comes Susie, and all that. Had a gentleman that came in every Tuesday. And excuse me what I'm fixing to say, but I'm going to try to make a point about the man of the house and the, to, to command his children. And he came in, and after a period of time, he was there every Tuesday. Brought in his laundry and cleaned it, and they talked to with my father-in-law, and all of a sudden he was absent. Lord help us. And finally, in about three, four, five weeks, he came back, and uh, they started talking. He said, "You've been gone for a while." He said, uh, "Yes, sir, been gone." So where have you been? He said, "I've been in the hospital." Please excuse me what I'm fixing to say. He's in the hospital. He said, I've been in the hospital. What? I've been sick. I've been sick. And my father said, well, what, what, what was wrong? He said, sir, do you know what I do for a living? And he said, well, no. He said, God help us. I impregnate women so they can have children so they can get government. Monies. Live on that. That's the day in what we live. 
Oh, we mean men of God, fathers. Now, what did this just say there? That he may command his children, his personal children. We have a lot of children wandering out there who do have not, don't even know who their father is. But all oh, those that do know it. We as fathers command our children, direct our children, train up a child in the way it should go, and then his household after him. And notice that they, and how is to do it? To keep the way of the Lord, to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which was spoken of him. He was just saying of Abraham, what a great and wonderful man that he was, because of, of he will command his children. Commanded himself and instructed himself, but also the household that he had. Great man of God. And doing through that and teaching and training up. I remember going to Sunday school and, and doing way back under. And young age, young age, Sunday school. Uh, getting little things and that's got a, a verse on it written out. It might be a butterfly, it might be a bird, it might be a dog, it might be a piece of puzzle, and so forth, who had to memorize those verses, you know, in the first grade, second grade, third grade, and on on up, and junior high, senior high, school. Had, we had Bible reading in school. Every time we, every morning in high school, the word was taught. Amen. Read and prayed yeah. over the, high, the loud speaker system. Yeah. Big Spring, Texas again. Every day, every day. Now you can't even take a Bible. I had Bible class in, in uh, uh, high school. High school. Oh, when we think of that, a home, our society, how far away we've come. But thank God we've got some, some that stand pat and stands true, that still knows, loves this Bible, loves the Lord, going to teach this Bible, going to train up kids in which they should go. When they're old, they shall not depart from it because of men that will stand for God and, and the purpose of being here, and that is to get saved and then go out into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The home, the home. One of the most important things about the home is the fact of being able to gather around the Word of God and read it and have prayer uh, around the home and so forth. What an important thing that is for you and me. What is important that ain't for our little kids as they grew up, grandkids as they come into our home as we do all the time. And just, we don't change a thing hardly when people come into our house. We just do what we normally do. Of course, with grandkids, you have to change some things for them, but that's all right. But I'm just saying that God is looking for a man that will train up his children have a home that will be, when people walk in, they know it's different because it's a Christian home. They walk into your living room and there sits a, an old dusty back book. No, ain't dusty there because it's been used so much. Sitting on the table. What am I saying? But God, what are you saying? That we not got to get back to where we used to. Amen. The first book in our colleges, in our schools, was the Bible. The Bible. First book in our homes should be the Bible. God help us as men and husbands, fathers, to have a home like God wants. And when it's all said and done, dear friend, and we've done our very best to live for the Lord and to stand for the Lord and stand for what God wants us to do. <coughs> we see here that it'll be a man that will be prepared. It'll be a family that will be prepared. There'll be children that will be prepared. And what is that for? Prepared for heaven. For heaven. Oh, we have a good country. We have a good church. We have good families. And bless God, we go through all of that. What heaven's going to be? Amen. What heaven's going to be for us? When we stand before the Lord and and he starts giving out all those gifts and all those rewards and, and shows uh, what you've done and how that you've done this. He said, for me and my house, he said, I want you to live as a Christian and live for the Lord. For me is Christ, and to die is gain. That's what Paul said. And when we look at these things, we think it's a wonderful thing.
when it's all said and done, we could sing when we all get to heaven. What a joy, what happiness, what joy that's going to be. I see in John chapter 14, he said just simply this. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Why? Because in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. If I go and prepare a place for you, and you know that's what the Lord's doing right now, with all the turmoil and all the mess that we're in in our country, in our life, in our, in our homes here, in not only America, but around this nation. But he said, one day, one day it's all going to be over. As I prepare a place for you in glory. So let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Why is that? Because we put our faith and trust in the Lord who created the whole thing. And you know, some people say, I don't believe that. I can't trust that. Well, let me, let, let me challenge you to do one thing. One thing. If you doubt this scripture, if you doubt the things of the Lord, if you doubt what this church is trying to preach and teach and doubt Christianity and all that, I've got something I challenge you to do. And that is get you a ticket and go to Israel. And you go around Israel and begin looking at some stuff. You begin to look at things. You look at buildings. You look at old walls. You look at old streets. Go to the Sea of Galilee. See the Jordan River where he was baptized. Go to the place of a skull where he was crucified. And there he's, he didn't spill his blood. He poured out his blood for you and for me. And then all of the suffering that took place. Cat of nine tails. Nailed to that old cross. Crowned with a thorn of crowns. Beaten until he's just a pup. With all of that took place, and as it was there on that cross, finally he said, it is finished. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he was gone. They took him down, prepared the body, and put it in a tomb. And we know the story. Three days later, that tomb was empty. If you want to be encouraged, you want to say, is there anything to this Christianity? Well, i got news for it. Go to the Holy Land. And understand what happened 2,000 plus years ago. And you stand outside that opening inside of that place and realize that was the place where the body of Jesus was laid. But you know what? There's no sign of it being there. You know why? Because up from the grave he arose. One, the assurance of everything that we've got and all that's going on and being good, bad, or indifferent, that we have the blessed hope because our Lord and Savior came up from that grave and became victorious over death, hell, and the grave. Thank God for that. And we can serve him, honor him. And he went back and said, you know, as you see him go, he said, I'll even come back. One day we were going to look forward now for his second coming. Even so come, Lord Jesus. So on Father's Day today, help us as fathers to be the best we can be. Help us to be the best as far as in our country is concerned, the best citizen we can be. And then also the best head of the home, the best home we can have. And not only that, to train and to teach and with our wife and our children, but then not only that, be the best uh, person in our church, if you please. Being as good as we can, doing what we can for the cause of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because one day he's coming. And when he does, we'll be rewarded. Amen. Be blessed. Oh, fathers, listen. Listen to me this morning. We close. What, what have we done? What can we do? Oh, we can keep on keeping on for him. Because if we serve him, one day we'll receive that reward. One day you'll receive that reward. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Let's serve him. Oh, on this Father's Day from now on, let's serve him. If God's looking for a man to do something, let's do the very best we can personally so that he can say, there is one. I can use him. I can use him. I can use him.
Search your heart today. But you've got to have a start. And that start is, do you know Christ as your personal Savior? Have you ever trusted in him as your personal Savior? If you haven't, this is the best time in the world to do it. Here on Father's Day. On Father's Day of this year, I trusted Christ as my Savior. I pray that you'll do that. Let's have every head bowed.